Thank you all for coming um, to hear the latest from the Dawn Mission. Dawn continues to plow new ground at Ceres, uh, having recently concluded our first extended mission. And during the extended mission, um, we uh, used our time at low altitude to zoom in on several interesting features and collect uh, more high resolution imaging and spectra. And we also completed the coverage we needed to produce uh, a high resolution map of the surface elevation. And these data um, will be part of the, the research that you're seeing today. So in uh, today's presentation is presenting some research which is trying to help us understand the extent to which Ceres has been active um, in the recent past and whether there is possibly ongoing recurring uh, geologic activity. And before Dawn launched, we viewed Vesta and Ceres as time capsules or fossils frozen in time from the beginning of the solar system. And while we thought that Ceres likely had some uh, liquid water in the past, um, possibly some at the present, um, what we did not expect was to see these abundant bright deposits uh, splayed across the surface associated with sodium carbonate, which is a mineral that's uh, associated with hydrothermal deposits on the Earth and is also coming out of the plumes of Enceladus. So this is a very special circumstance that highlights the fact that Ceres is a very special body in our solar system. So a Ceres, as it turns out, is an exciting and active frozen ocean world. I meant to put my first slide up <laughs> before I did that introduction. So Ceres has a lot of bright spots, and the Dawn team and the public alike were really entranced by, on, on approach to Ceres by this bright spot that was beaming at us. And of course, as we got closer, and it, uh, we, we saw the extent to which there were many, many bright areas, um, it became even more exciting. We now know that this bright material um, reveals evidence for the past subsurface ocean um, and geologic processes which have been bringing it to the surface. So one of the regions that we targeted in our first extended mission was the Okotter Crater. Um, it's a 57 kilometer diameter crater in the low northern latitudes. And it hosts the uh, brightest material in Ceres, the Seralia facula in the center, and also a set of diffuse bright uh, areas, which are termed the Vanellia faculae. And uh, we believe that Akator is a uh, relatively young crater, and that the deposits in the crater are, um, are younger than the, the crater itself. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we did in our first extended mission was create a, a surface elevation map at high resolution, and this is it. Um, the high standing regions are shown in red, and the low areas are in the deepest blue. And uh, one of the things that, that may stand out to you is that the bright deposits are uh, concentrated in the portion of the crater, which is the lowest elevations. So looking in some perspective views um, of the, the crater walls, we see here um, one of the characteristics of the crater, which is, uh, I think, fundamental to what's going on in terms of the ge geology and the, the cryomagmatic processes, and that's uh, that there are abundant fracture networks. And here you can see one that's, um, that's coming through the terraced wall deposits and then uh, crossing the floor of the crater. And if we look at it, in aerial view, the same area, you can see that um, those craters in this fairly young slump deposit um, show a, a, a roughly radial pattern. And the radial pattern is most likely associated with material which is pushing up from under the crater floor, um, probably a plug of material, or maybe a plug of material which is trying to make its way to the surface. And then you also notice that those fractures uh, continue across the crater floor and, um, and are going through or close by to the central pit, which is that smooth blue region um, up at the upper right. 
So this is a close-up of the, uh, the center of the crater um, in a um, enhanced color image. And what you see is that uh, the, the central pit has a, a complex structure. Um, it has diffuse bright deposits as well as a central dome. And the central dome um, has another radial fracture pattern, um, again, indicating upward motion of the material. So likely this, uh, this, this doming um, is, is fairly recent and we're still seeing the evidence in the, in the fracture network. Um, we're also seeing a lot of concentric fractures around that central pit and, um, and then the, the, the fractures continue um, to intersect with the area where the Vanalia faculae are located. So uh, Linnea and Nathan will be telling you a lot more about their research on um, these intriguing deposits and um, how they postulate they may have formed. But I'll end with a look forward to what Don will be doing in its second extended mission. Um, we're going to be using an elliptical orbit to dive uh, closer to the surface than we have before, um, down to 30 kilometers altitude, to get uh, better accuracy and resolution of the chemistry of the surface, and to get unprecedented high resolution views of specific features um, to help us to better understand these cryomagmatic processes. Um, we're, we're aiming to test our um, ideas about the origin and evolution of series, and, and then to better understand uh, what's driving cryovolcanism, what's bringing um, this material to the surface. And uh, now I will turn it over to Nathan, who will give you um, a new look at the bright material. Great. Thank you, Carol. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the bright spots, uh, and right off the bat, I want to mention a series of bright spots are intriguing, uh, not just because they're unique relative to what we see on the surface, but because they offer uh, a window into the processes that occurred in the series subsurface and may still be occurring. Uh, and the work I'll talk about here uh, represents the culmination of a broad survey uh, using thousands of images from Don's framing camera uh, to um, characterize bright material across the surface and figure out where it is. Um, so right off the bat, I want to stress a, a few conclusions. One is that, uh, as Carol mentioned, bright spots aren't just limited to a single place on the surface. We actually see them uh, across the entirety of series, uh, more than 300 in total. Uh, I also want to mention that brightness is a relative term. Uh, the brightest spot on the surface, Cerealia facula, has an albedo of between 0.4 and 0.5. Uh, on average, most bright spots are closer to the average surface albedo, which is closer to 0 0.08, which is a, a little bit brighter than charcoal. Uh, the second point is that the great majority of bright spots are associated with impact craters, and this isn't a coincidence. Their formation is actually intimately tied to impact processes, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, the third is that bright spots are generally geologically young features. Uh, they range in age from uh, as little as several hundred thousand years or perhaps younger, uh, up to a few hundred million years. Uh, fourth is that the formation of bright spots uh, requires the presence of liquid brines in some areas while they're forming. Uh, and then finally, the presence of very young bright spots on the surface indicates that there uh, may still be liquid brines in some areas in the subsurface, even in present day. So that is, the series isn't a dead body. Uh, the surface is still dynamic. So the image that you're seeing here uh, it represents a culmination of the survey. So these are uh, all of the bright spots that we see on Ceres, and they're color-coded according to their classification. So we've grouped bright spots into four different classes based on associated uh, geologic features. And I'll walk through these classes. Uh, so this is a type example of each of these four classes. In the upper left-hand corner, you see Soralia facula. This is the brightest and most spatially extensive uh, bright spot on the surface. Um, and that's one type of bright spot that you find on the floors uh, of craters, either associated with central pits or peaks, or also crater floor fractures, such as the case for the Vanalia faculae. Um, 
by number, the, the majority of bright spots we see occur on the rims or walls of craters. Uh, you see on the right there, the rim of Dantu Crater, the southwest rim. Uh, and that bright material usually streaks down crater walls, sometimes all the way to the crater floors. We also see bright material in crater ejecta. Uh, this is Haolani Crater, which also has uh, other types of bright material. Uh, and finally, we see the lone example of Ahuna Mons. This is a four to five kilometer tall mountain, likely a cryovolcanic dome, that has bright material streaking down its sides. Uh, I'll talk more about the crater floor bright spots, and these are a couple of examples. Uh, we found floor bright spots in eight craters on Ceres, uh, including Akata uh, and Haolani Crater, which you see here. So you can see Soralia Facula, um, and in Haolani Crater, which is also a, a fairly young crater on the order of 30 million or so years, uh, we see bright material uh, streaking down from a, a central peak complex. And so some, some points here that I want to stress are that, uh, in general, bright spots are geologically recent. Um, some recent work has attempted to date uh, bright material in Akater Crater uh, on the basis of uh, crater counting in the material itself, and has found that uh, those ages, the ages range from uh, several hundred thousand to a few million years, um, perhaps significantly younger than the age of the parent crater itself. Uh, and the majority of bright spots on the surface either formed or were exposed by impacts uh, over the last uh, several million to tens of millions of years. Um, the second is that uh, ongoing activity uh, is a possibility given that the bright deposits are so young. Uh, it's likely that liquid brine still exists in the subsurface in some places uh, and may form bright spots even in the recent past. Um, and we'll hear more from Linnae about the processes that actually go into uh, forming uh, these bright deposits, but in general for these floor bright spots it uh, requires liquid brines in the subsurface to rise to the surface. Uh, the final figure I'll show you is an example of a couple of craters that have a bright material on their rims. Uh, these are Juling and Cupola. Uh, again, by number, uh, the majority of bright deposits on the surface are of this type. They occur on the rims of craters and they streak down crater walls. Um, and these are somewhat distinct in terms of their formation mechanism from the floor bright material in that this bright material was in the subsurface and was exhumed by impacts. And that's also the way uh, likely that bright ejecta uh, are formed. And uh, this is an important distinction to keep in mind when you hear Linnae talk about the formation of Soralia facula and Vanellia faculae. Um, and so, it, you know, this is exciting in that it indicates that, that Ceres really isn't a dead world. Uh, and as Dawn continues its mission, uh, we're also going to continue to try to uh, characterize and understand uh, in more detail how these bright deposits formed, also leaning on information from additional uh, Dawn instruments, such as the Vera instrument, uh, to get a better idea of their composition and what that means for Ceres subsurface. So I'll turn it over to Linnae now. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, and so I am just going to quickly go into how we believe these brines came to the surface and formed these bright spots. But before I go into that, I want to say, just reiterate how excited we are about Ceres uh, in general and about uh, what's happening at Akator specifically. We believe these bright spots uh, are uh, signs that Ceres may have once had uh, a global ocean. And so uh, we're very excited about that. And we also, we believe what's happening what has happened at Akator in the past may be similar to what uh, could be happening today, albeit at a larger scale, um, on some of the active icy moons and in the outer solar system, uh, such as Europa and Enceladus, for example. So let's get right into it. So Nathan mentioned brines coming to uh, the surface uh, and, and forming some of these bright deposits. Well, just how do they get there? And so if we look at the, the image at the top, we see our, our nice brine reservoir. So we have liquids uh, with lots Lots of, of salts, um, and it's it's just sitting there, not bothering anybody, just beneath the subsurface. And what happens if we look at uh, the the image on the bottom? Um, to uh, my right, your left, is you see that uh, the, over time, the brine reservoir is going to begin to uh, freeze. And we know that ice takes up more space than liquid takes up. So as it begins to freeze uh, and, and continues to freeze, uh, there's nowhere for the liquid to go but to be pushed up in fractures. Um, and that's one, one way we could have gotten uh, these brines on the surface. Another way, uh, which is the figure beside it, is that the uh, impact 
impactor that hit Ceres and formed Akator um, could have hit uh, Ceres with such force that it kind of squeezed and pinched this brine reservoir. And again, as it was squeezed and pinched, this water, uh, or excuse me, these brines were uh, brought to the surface in fractures as a result of that. So what happens when these brines get to the surface? We have a, a couple of interesting things that, uh, that, that we believe happen. So uh, first off, uh, because Ceres does not have an atmosphere, it's a zero pressure surface environment. And so when brines get to the surface, um, they are going to want to uh, fountain and, and boil. And what do I mean by that? Well, we've all uh, seen what happens if we shake up a, a soda can and then take the top off. And then you have this, we, we call it soda exploding, but really Really what you have is a fountaining of, of the liquids and the vapor. And we believe that when the brines get to the surface of, of Ceres, that's what, what happened. And uh, if we look at this first red arrow at the top, uh, we believe this fountaining caused, uh, caused vapor, it caused ice particles, it caused soft particles to be launched on ballistic trajectories and form the ragged edge of the Cerulea bright spot, which we see this arrow at the top pointing to. Um, now, after some time and after some cooling has taken place, what we're going to get is uh, uh, ice, an ice layer. Um, again, looking at the, the top image, we're going to get an ice layer on top of these brines. After we have this ice layer, uh, the brines are going to be able to flow beneath it. Um, it's going to insulate them. And this is what we see on the image at the bottom where we see uh, s sort of a plug of material, uh, a high viscosity brine, or, or as we may call it, a, a cryolava kind of uh, erupting onto the surface, um, insulated again, as I said, by this ice layer. And because it's so high viscosity, it pools um, into a dome-like shape. And if we look at this second uh, red arrow that's pointing more so to the center uh, of uh, Cerulea, we, we think that's how the dome formed, the Cerulea dome formed. Um, and what's interesting about this is anytime we get a crack or a rupture in this ice layer, we are going to see that fountaining again. And it's going to, we're going to have particles, salt particles, and vapor again uh, launched on these trajectories. And it's going to create more bright material. Uh, it's quite possible that this ice layer uh, ruptured during the formation of the Cerulea Dome and also after the formation of the Cerulea Dome. And so when we see these bright, this one bright spot that sits right on top of the dome, uh, we believe that we can attribute it to that. And so also looking at the bottom uh, image, Nathan talked a little bit about Ahuna Mons. And Ahuna Mons, is, as we all know, is our favorite cryovolcano on Ceres. And it's believed that Ahuna Mons formed in the same way that the Cerulea Dome formed um, with just uh, brines that just uh, were in place onto the surface and pooled into a dome-like shape. So it's really interesting to compare the formation uh, of the two. Also, uh, we have the Benalia bright spots, as, as Carol showed, to the east of uh, the Cerulea uh, faculae and the Cerulea dome. And again, we believe that what formed them, if we look at the edges of the two largest bright spots, they're a little, little wispy and a little rugged, and we believe that this is another case where we uh, could have had a reservoir of brine uh, that also had quite a bit of volatiles, quite a bit of uh, gases such as water vapor or methane or carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, this brine uh, with all of these gases uh, was transported in fractures. As the fractures intersected the surface again, you again have this fountaining um, and this launching of salt particles um, onto the surface, and that's what created the Vinalia bright spots. And just to kind of kind of bring this home, I talked about Cerulea facula and the Cerulea dome and how the dome formed and how at some point you got fountaining that created the bright deposits. Um, this is a nice image from uh, image credit the U.S. Geological Survey uh, from uh, of Mount St. Helens, um, and we know that Mount St. Helens had a dynamic uh, eruption in uh, 1980, and and since then it's been rebuilding itself. And here's an image of the mounts of. of, of excuse me, an image of some of, some of the uh, domes at the top of Mount St. Helens. Um, and so these Mount St. Helens domes could have, uh, could serve as analogs uh, for Cerulea Dome, um, just in the sense that these domes were formed by a very high viscosity liquid uh, being in place onto the surface. In this case, we have lava uh, erupting onto the surface. Uh, we see uh, an 
a little bit of venting here and, and an eruption column, and basically uh, this would be analogous to uh, the fountaining that we see that launched particles on, on ballistic trajectories that formed, uh, the, in the case of the Soralia uh, dome, the bright spots that sit right atop the dome. And so, but in this case, when we're thinking about the Mount St. Helens dome, instead of having vapor and salt particles and ice crystals, what we would have had here would have been ash and rock particles. So I think that's something really interesting to think about and just to uh, compare what we believe happened um, at Akator Crater to uh, what uh, processes we have seen occurring on Earth. And so I just want to reiterate that we're, we're absolutely thrilled uh, about these results um, and that as the only uh, dwarf planet in the inner solar system, um, series again continues to um, excite us. Uh, the results that we've shown here, the imagery that we've shown here um, is, is our, uh, it's new, it's, it's mysterious. Um, and uh, again, uh, what happened at Akator could be just a small scale example of what is occurring uh, today on the icy satellites of the outer planets. Uh, so uh, on behalf of, of Carol and Nathan and I and the whole Don team, thank you so much. All right, so now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. Do we have any questions? No questions? Oh, yeah. Harvey Leifert, uh, Freelance. This is really peripheral, but I'd like to know about the status of the names you give these places. Are they just your working names? Do they have any official recognition from IAU, or is it below their threshold of interest? No, they're, they're absolutely sanctioned by the IAU. Uh, we, we started sometime before we got to Ceres to have our theme um, approved. And uh, our theme is, is harvest festivals and deities. And uh, we, we go through a process with them of, uh, of choosing and of getting approval for names. Christoph Seidler, Spiegel Online. Um, Linné, just maybe a stupid question, but you mentioned the subsurface brines. How did they get there in the first place? I understand how they evolve, mm -hmm. but how did they get there in the first oh, place? That's, that's actually a great question. So uh, we believe that Ceres at one point had a, uh, a global ocean, and so those brine pockets would just be remnants um, of that ocean as it, as it began to freeze. Uh, hi, Ken Chan, New York Times. Uh, this is for Linnea Quick. I guess I'm asking by the comparison with St. Helens. Um, I mean, here it seems like it's because of there's still um, lava underneath pushing upward, magma pushing upward. And from what you're describing, it's the subsurface brine has been cut off after it's, and it's just the, the brine that's been pulled on the surface sort of clumping up into a dome. Yes. So that seems qualitatively different from what's going on in St. Helens? Well, no. Uh, in both cases, you, you have a liquid that is being pushed to the surface continuously to form a dome. I think the, the cartoons that I showed were a little bit simplified. Um, but you do have uh, uh, fractures bringing up liquid from a subsurface source in both cases. Does that answer your question? Or did I not understand your um, question? So would there's, there's presumably still a, uh, still a subsurface brine reservoir below that? Well, or well, we don't know. and we're, we're still analyzing data, so there's, there's more to come. But what we think is that the brine reservoir has probably cooled by now. In fact, it was the part of the freezing of that reservoir that actually allowed these brines to be brought to the surface. So uh, yes. OK. Elizabeth Bailey, Caltech. Uh, so if you are proposing that the impact, um, if the compression from that could cause the uh, brine to come to the surface, could heating from impact also have a similar effect? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Could it, what type of impact have a similar effect? Sorry, could heating, uh, the heat generated from the impact? Yes, and we, we've actually, actually looked at that. There are also uh, several other models that suggest that you could have had heat from an impact that actually created additional warm pockets um, on Ceres. So, yes. One of the um, goals in the extended mission is to test um, the, the composition 
of those materials to try to um, distinguish between whether they come from deep within the, um, the crust of series or whether they may be um, material that was melted in the more shallow subsurface by the impact heat itself. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Jeff out of Space News. Uh, for Carol Raymond, how long do you think you'll be able to continue operating Dawn in this uh, new extended mission? So there's um, uncertainty in the amount of usable hydrazine, which is our limiting resource. And it also depends on um, exactly how we use it. And so we're still working through uh, the finalizing the plan, but I think a good um, estimate is through is, is that we would begin to descend in the uh, spring next year um, to into this lower elliptical orbit, and we would be able to operate there for on the order of three or four months. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Anything on the web chat? No. Okay, well that's it. Thank you so much to our panelists. And uh, we'll start again tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Thanks guys.